is going to talk about multi-input recommendations. This has to be a first, the, the disco balls and things like that. Uh, I feel like Steve Ballmer or somebody up here um, <laughs> pretending I could dance. So anyway, I want to talk about recommendations, but first uh, a little bit of introduction there. I'm Ted Dunning, Chief Application Architect. Uh, I have a, a bit of a history with Apache, a very long history with open source since probably well, 1975, you guys can raise your hand if you were born. Uh, MEMPAR is where I work. We distribute open source components, things like MapReduce and Hadoop and many others, HBase, Hive, and so on. And we also distribute a technology base on top of that, which adds many types of interface, much more stability and performance. Uh, we've got a couple of hashtags tonight, MAPR. I made up one. Uh, it's supposed to be an engine hook, uh, but it's much up the way it came out. Uh, Apache Mahood, Apache Grill, me, and so on. So here's the topics. What is recommendation? What makes it different from other kinds of machine learning? How we can do it, uh, especially with multimodal recommendations? Typo, even in the dark. Uh, and how we can build one with things that you would find around the house. So, not, not difficult things, just very straightforward things. And of course, you want a detailed breakdown, you want code samples, things like that. Uh, you want a, a live machine. Well, we may have to summarize a little bit because there's only 30 minutes, at least a little bit. Okay, so first five minutes of background, the second part will be, I want a pony. You'll have to remember that so you'll understand what it means. And so, here we go. Five minutes of background. The first question is, what does machine learning look like? It looks like this. It looks like the entire web. Many, many websites are actually structured almost entirely by machine learning. Very many of them provide services that are based on machine learning. And underneath, there's lots of machine learning so that the systems can do things in reasonably intelligent ways, like not make huge mistakes. But of course, we know that secretly underneath, it's a gray world full of mathematics and big clusters and so on. But we can make that much simpler, actually. Uh, we're going to show how to make that much more simple, much more straightforward. And it's particularly with recommendations. Uh, one of the things that we see with recommendations as a trend is not just movies, not just books, but you see it even as an organizing principle in user interfaces. Uh, the recent edition of Google Maps is almost entirely driven by recommendations. The things that you see are in fact recommendations. If I search for a restaurant by name that's near the map our offices, it shows me other restaurants in about the same price range and about the same exotic level. If I search for the map our headquarters, I find high-tech businesses around that area, and I don't see restaurants. And actually, after the first three times I gave that demo, it started showing me both, because it says, this guy looks for restaurants here, then he looks for high tech. So it shows me both. So it's adapting to what I do based on my behavior, and it's understanding what a restaurant is. There is no technical reason that something called Piatti's would be a restaurant, and something called Map R would be not a restaurant but it understands that because of people's actions. And so we see this, that computers become apparently intelligent through recommendations, and therefore they can do much better user interfaces. And this apparent intelligence is actually reflected intelligence, not artificial intelligence. So let's talk about how it works. Remember, I still want to point. Okay. This doesn't work in German, I guess. Not to have. So, the idea of recommendations is we want to look at the behavior of a crowd. We want to see what they do, and from that understand what a single person will do. It's not that they will be somebody identical to that person in the crowd. We're all different. But there will be components of their behavior that we can understand from various average behaviors. Come 
emergent behaviors. And here's a simple example. Suppose Alice gets an apple and a puppy, and Charles got a bicycle. And then Bob shows up and he gets an apple. What are we supposed to give him next? What would we recommend? Well, obviously we would recommend a pony. I'm sorry, a puppy. <laughs> These are statistical algorithms. Occasionally they make mistakes. I'm a statistician, so occasionally I make mistakes too. But anyway, you get the idea. Okay. And of course, Bob wants a pony as well. I shouldn't have broken the joke there. In fact, everybody wants a pony. I mean, you know this. Everybody wanted a pony when they were little. They probably still secretly do. Now, what if everybody gets a pony? And so Amelia comes in, and she gets a pony. What else are we going to recommend her? The, the fact that she got a pony is completely uninformative. So before we had a weak signal from the apple for Bob, but now we have essentially no signal from the pony because everybody gets it. And these are the two things that we have to worry about with recommendations. Signals that are ubiquitous and mean nothing and signals which actually indicate something. Now, of course, we probably, since we say pony means nothing, so we know that Amelia is a user, what do users most want? They want puppies and they want apples. So that's what we recommend first. So here is the problem statement then. The real problem statement is common items co occur with everything, and it's not very interesting that they do this. Uh, other things, anomalous items, will show patterns of co occurrence. And those patterns of co occurrence are what we have to find. The significant or anomalous co-occurrence. The things that occur together more than we would expect. Those are the signals that we really have to find out there. Now the behavior that we saw a little bit, this is what it looks like in the computer. Well, not quite like that. It doesn't have the pretty little pictures. But this is what a log file looks like in the computer. It has each person in different times, and they're all interlaced together. So we the next step is to reduce that to a matrix form. In the matrix form, we begin to be where we can apply algebraic operations here. And notably, we can see that, there, there's my cursor, that apple and puppy co-occurred once with Alice, Al, apple and pony co-occurred twice, and so on. You can see that pony and bicycle co-occurred as well. We can see that everybody on the background got the pony, and so we can see that it's uninteresting that it co-occurred with apple, because if pony occurs everywhere, the fact that it occurred with every apple is completely boring. So what we derive from this, then, is a co-occurrence matrix. This is a count of how often each of the pairs of items co-occur. Now, the computational simplicities that we go through to get this and out of this, this co-occurrence matrix, we build a simpler co-occurrence matrix. All of the people who got an apple are in one column. All of the people who did not are in the other column. All of the people who got a puppy are in one row. All of the people who did not are in the other row. So how often did somebody get an apple and a puppy? One person, that was Alice. And one person got an apple, but not a puppy. That was Bob. One person didn't get an apple and didn't get a puppy. That was Charles. Now, this is totally boring because there's only three people. But if we have more counts, we can see patterns then. This upper left case, when A occurs, B occurs 1.3% of the time, plus or minus about a half percent just due to statistical fluctuations. When, B, or when A does not occur, B occurs exactly 1% of the time. And so we have no interesting co-occurrence there. And we actually have enough counts to know that this is pretty emphatically uninteresting. The next one over here, A and B only ever occur together, never apart. But we only have three people. So that's also not very interesting because Three people? I mean, it kind of has to happen that something odd happens. It's just not very interesting. But what if A and B occur together only 
out of 10,001 people. There's much more interesting because A is very rare, B is very rare, and yet they only occur together that one time that they occur. Kind of interesting. Here's a much more interesting case. 10 times as many of everything here. A and B occur together 10 times, never apart. And 100,000 times where they didn't occur, either one. This is beginning to be very strong evidence. And so indeed, we can score those using a simple score called block likelihood ratio. We won't define that right now because this is a 30 minute talk, but it's not hard. It's about 10 lines of code. And so if these are roughly in the units of standard deviations, that one is very exciting. That is a pattern. And this one over here will occur about once out of every 40,000 pairs. So if we have 10 million pairs, we'll have lots and lots of those, even at accidental rates. Eh, not so interesting unless we have nothing else. And these other things are just fairly small numbers and worth throwing away. And so what we do is we take that co-occurrence matrix that we had before and we reduce it to a binary form. Only those pairs that have an interesting score like this get a checkbox in the end. Now, I've kind of overemphasized it here. The, the, in fact, puppy and apple probably wouldn't be interesting with only three people. But you get the idea. And so if we take this one row, this puppy row, there's one thing that indicates that a puppy should be recommended, and that's apple. Simple. And so we take that one row, and in a very simple implementation, what we can do is we can have a document. I mean, we're almost certainly, if we're going to build a website and we have items, things like that, we'll have some kind of database. And that database will have an ID, and it'll have a description, and it'll have a title, those sorts of things. And indeed, that's what we have here. We have this in the form that we would typically put into a text retrieval database, like Solar. So there are fields, ID, description, title, and so on. And then we've added one more field, which is called indicators. And that field is those things where there was a significant co-occurrence. Makes sense? It's almost too simple, isn't it? Co-occurrence, find the significant ones, put it in a text retrieval thing. And what we can then do is we can do a search. When somebody comes in, like Bob, and he has a history of Apple, we can use Apple as a query as if it were text. It's not text. It's a symbol. T1 here. But it only will appear on the documents for which Apple is an indicator. So the retrieval results from that search will, in fact, be recommendations. And so that's pretty exciting that that gives us a recommendation engine. And I think I have a picture coming up. Yeah. So here's a picture. This is very hard to read because it's very small print. This is Lucidworks. Lucidworks packages up Solar Lucene with a lot of convenience routines and such, and a nice interface. You can see in the center I've done a search for Indicator Artist 2122 or Indicator Artist 303. I happen to have the secret knowledge that 2122 is Fats Domino and 303 is the Beatles. 2122, Fats Domino, being kind of an early rock and roll sort of person, and the Beatles being kind of the definition of rock and roll anymore. And so what we get here are other artists here. These results, that's one result. Here's another result. And Chuck Berry is the top result. And the reason that we get a result is because there are all of these indicator artists. Here we go. In fact, let's magnify that. You can see a, a whole long list of indicator artists attached to Chuck Berry. And so that's why we got that, is because the indicators for Chuck Berry include the Beatles and Fats Domino. Well, at this point, you can begin to see 
how do you build a system? It's so simple. You build the indicators, you add them to the index, and shazam, you've got a recommendation engine. It's very simple. But there's actually some very exciting things behind this. If we change the way we represent this, remember I drew a matrix? Well, matrices are often written mathematically. And so what we can do is we can, we can draw this whole idea here of a recommendation engine using mathematical notation. So H is a vector. It's a list of things, things that exist in somebody's history. A is the matrix that we had earlier. It has rows for users and columns for things. And when I have a user by thing matrix that I multiply by a thing by one vector, I get a user by one vector. So AH translates the thing history into a vector of users. In fact, it's doing the operation. Users who did H1, H2, H3, and so on, This is the users. This is a treating a set of users. And then I can multiply by a transpose on the left. That's now a thing by user matrix. So it translates it back to things. So that last expression there, a transpose parenthesis AH, the next last one, is users who did H also did such and such. That's, that's recommendation and it's part at the collaborative filtering anyway. Now, there, there's two time scales there. One is slow. The big matrix A changes relatively slowly. The pieces of it change not so fast because most of the music that people have played is in the past. There's a vast amount of data there, and the most recent five minutes doesn't change that very much at all. And then the, another way to say that is the relationship, say, between Bach and Beethoven is not going to be changed by new music that appeared today. That's stable. And Chuck Berry and the Beatles and, and so on. That's not going to be changed by what happened in the last five minutes. So there's a stable part of this competition. That's the relationship between artists or items. And there's a very unstable part, which is what have you done in the last five minutes? So we have two time scales. One is on the range of years or centuries, and one is on the range of seconds. So this last expression is very nice because it takes the slow parts and just moves the parentheses around the slow part. And then at the last minute, it multiplies by the fast part. It segregates the computation into slow changing parts that we can do overnight and the fast changing part, which is what we want to do when I give you a recommendation. So this last thing is what's called item-centric recommendation, and it's very much easier than user-centric recommendation because we do much of the computation offline. And in fact, this is what we did with the, the search engine. This part is the search, is the, the co-occurrence. Now we reduced it to a binary form and then applied weighting just for the search engine but it's the same idea. Okay, so that's exciting. I mean, it's mathematics. It's really exciting. Even if it didn't have Greek letters, it's still exciting. So let's make it even more exciting. We have this matrix users by things, right? But we might have two kinds of things. We might have things that we want to recommend and then things we want to observe, but we can't really recommend them. So for instance, what year were you born? Well, I can't really recommend that you be born in 1975 or, or 1991 or 1982. I can't recommend that to you. It just is. But it's a thing about you that would tell us a lot about the musical taste you have. We should be able to recommend from the year you're born to the music. So the year you're born is a kind of thing that we don't want to recommend, but we want to use for recommendation. So there's lots of things like that. Where do you live? What language do you apparently speak? Things like that. And so let's have two kinds of things. And let's put them side by side in the matrix. We still have the same rows, the users. Now we have two kinds of columns, A1 and A2. And now, man, 
What we can do, there seems to be a slide that disappeared there. What we can do is we can do all of that math with the A transpose A, but with these two kinds of matrices. And we can show that if you just put in multiple indicator fields inside the text retrieval engine, you get the same effect as if you had done all of the multiplication on these two parts. Now, when you do the multiplication on the two parts, you get four subproducts. And each of those has to be multiplied by the first half of the history or the second half. And then, of course, you only keep the top, so we can only keep two of those. And in practice, of course, there's more than two. Two is just a shorthand for as many as you like. There's only three nice numbers, of course, zero, one, and infinity. So two is just a synonym for infinity. But what we can do then is we can take, say, data about um, people watching videos and people requesting videos. So they type in words. That's the first kind of thing. That's not generally something we recommend, but we might. Secondly, they watch videos. So A transpose A gives us query recommendation. Did you mean to ask for this? B transpose B gives video recommendation. So you've watched these things, and here's a list of other things you might want to watch. But this B transpose A is the cross recommendation from things you type into videos you might want to watch. Here's an example where we did this. We took a million videos that people were watching and so on. This is on a company I used to have. And we took all the queries that they were doing. And not necessarily the videos they watched in response to the queries. The videos they watched the week before, the week after, whatever described their interests. And likewise, all of the queries they did. Not just the latest ones, all of them. And when we typed in Paco de Lucia, conventional metadata search gave us Hombros de Paco, which is Spanish daytime television. It is not the Spanish guitarist Paco de Lucia. It's a complete garbage result. But the recommendation based search, the B transpose A kind of search, gave classical guitarists. It gave flamenco dancers. It gave more classical guitars. It gave Van Halen doing a classical guitar riff during a concert. And it gave guys into dorm rooms trying to play flamenco. So here's the classic ordinary retrieval results. And you can see, indeed, look, two out of three words, hombres, I'm sorry, de and Paco, match the query. Paco de Lucia, de Paco. Obviously perfect, right? So the text retrieval engine is doing exactly what we asked it to do. And it's crap. It's the wrong thing to do. What we should be doing instead is looking at behavior and getting classical guitar, flamenco dance, classical guitar, Van Halen, as I mentioned, freestyle flamenco in a dorm room. That's the way we want it to work. Because that's what people are saying that they want. It looks like people have engineered, you know, Luke Pablo Lucia is a musical player, uh, uh, an artist, plays guitar, he plays a particular style, Spanish guitar, and CUV is a, a flamenco uh, dance group. Flamenco dance is done in accompaniment to flamenco guitar music. That's a kind of Spanish guitar music, and so on. It looks like somebody did all that engineering, and in fact, they did. They just didn't do it by building trees and stuff. They just did it by watching the videos they wanted and by asking for the videos they wanted. And we can go further. We can build it into many, many different kinds of fields. We can have transactions from credit cards. And we can have a query of where you are and what you've done lately that then goes against many different kinds of indicators that are derived from previous occurrence. And then that can recommend all kinds of behaviors. Or what we did also is we put an opaque blob, just a logo on the website. That's behavior one. You click on that. Behavior two is you get to see things you want to consume. And by definition, the people who click on that want to consume things that the people who click on that want to consume. And so we can cross the behaviors. So the first 20 people who click on it get an under construction sign. Everybody later gets the things recommended for the composite of all the people who've clicked on it. 
I can build a self-organizing website that makes people happy by definition. Because they told us what they want. So, I'm Ted Dunning. Let's have some questions. I finished five minutes early. I apologize. So, any good questions? I'll assign questions if you don't ask them. Good. I yeah. have a question about the code curves. Uh, you, okay, but what is if you have some third or Latin factor? Like, for example, okay, usually you have this example where you have storks and you have a lot of uh, ch children born. So you would say, okay, there's a uh, co-occurrence which is the result of being a poor uh, region. So in maybe in your example where you, where you had, okay, an apple and, and a dog co-occurring, co maybe this could be because the person likes uh, uh, a healthy lifestyle. So shouldn't I maybe collect from the history of items? Maybe should I think and collect some kind of profile of this person? That I can say this is a, a person who wants to live healthy, so that I could uh, recommend um, healthy items. So it's kind of like one and a half questions, but underneath it are a whole bunch of issues that I think you're asking about. Can everybody hear? If the question is, what if there are multiple latent factors underneath there? And, and implied in the question is, shouldn't we identify and name those latent factors? Well, but the second one is, no. We should not try to engineer our impression of what these things are, because the users know more about themselves than we do. Maybe we know a little bit about them, where they're like us, but I had situations with music where people were clearly seeing differences in the music, that when I listened to them, I could not hear the difference. There's, there's death metal, there's black metal, there's umpty umpty other colors of metal, and I couldn't hear any difference between them. Now, some are sung in Icelandic, and some are sung in Finnish, some are in Old English, some are, who the hell knows what they are. And the people who listen to these things are vehement that there are huge differences. And if you give them the wrong thing, they totally upset with you. If I had tried to engineer and said, here's a lifestyle choice that you listen to Norse sagas to heavy metal accompaniment, I didn't know that lifestyle choice existed. And so I couldn't engineer that. I couldn't name it. I couldn't name the fact that Vietnamese communities in Paris, the east coast of the US, and the west coast of the US listen to very different kinds of Vietnamese music. These are things I could not know. Only my users could tell me these things. So I cannot name these things that I do not know. So I think it's a complete mistake to try to force these people to listen to the subtleties of music that I do. Now, there are many subtle effects that I'm papering over here. This approach nearly gets the big pieces that more than 20 people do. And so that's a limitation. Things that I do alone, only I do, it cannot recommend for. But it's remarkable the small number of people who have to do this in order to build a pattern. Now, another kind of latent variable that you alluded to when you mentioned Christmas and things like that is time. And this absolutely doesn't do that. Those are relatively, the really big time effects are easily found in this. These, these are the, 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 the two kinds of big time effects that you see are something becomes popular and then it fades away. Now, recommending things that have faded away is not a problem because either the people go, oh, I know about that. Yes, that's a good recommendation and it builds confidence. Or they say, oh, I didn't know about that. That's very cool. And, and they, they rediscover it. The second kind of temporal thing is like Christmas. And that's just a big mistake to, to recommend any Christmas music on January 1st. It's just a huge mistake. And so let's handle that by hand. So I, I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a theorist in, in so many strong sense. I'm a completely a pragmatist. And so yes, there are things missing here. But this is something you could build tonight and have working by tomorrow. And so it is a useful thing. There were two hands behind you. You have to be bold and assertive for me to hear you. Yeah, one question would be, uh, I don't think you would recommend, but uh, because you have a recommendation, uh, do you still think that the people 
molecule or only or any kind of content analysis would make any sense in this area. Um, and uh, the second question would be, uh, I heard that you made uh, one of the video recommendation engines or video recommendation uh, mechanisms uh, in a certain company. Uh, would you make it different today as, as you made it or, or would you change something in the architecture design you made it on this, uh, on this uh, design or something? So this is first question or transpose. You asked about five questions, but it really comes down to a few issues. Uh, so the, the, the first one is what about content analysis? There you have various forms of that. Should we analyze the video? Should we analyze the audio? I think it's becoming possible to find features in audio and video that which is not possible five years ago with deep learning and things like that, even though it's still extraordinarily expensive. And frankly, I think mostly that's bullshit. I, so I still wouldn't do that. And, and it's a very simple thought experiment uh, from, from the old music sorts of style. Would I recommend to somebody who likes Bob Dylan music that sounds like Bob Dylan? God, no. Because it sounds horrible. So the only reason people like that is because of the social effect around the music. And in fact, people have done very careful isolation experiments where they try to isolate different aspects of music appreciation and they find that the social aspect is 60 to 80 percent of the decision. And so the content doesn't tell you that. It's only the social structures around that. And the social structures are only evidenced in the behavior, essentially the social thing. Now, the other, skipping, skip, 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 the other big thing you asked about, would I do it differently? Absolutely, I would not waste my time trying 20 different things. I would just go to the simplest, and I would be done tomorrow. And the reason for that actually is because the quality of the algorithms for recommendation is a relatively small effect. You need something that's plausible. That, that if you look at the recommendations, you just don't go, this is stupid. You need to get above the, the laugh test. But beyond that, Structuring of the content, structuring of the website, providing uh, even randomization on the recommendation rules, which seems like it would cause degradation in results, but it actually improves it because it spreads out the training examples. Providing alternative pages for new content and popular content, and here's genre stuff, but really it's a recommendation for you with a Boolean qualifier on it. Things like that are the place that actually make much more difference than small changes in the quality of the algorithms. And so what I would do differently now is I would be much more aggressive on changing those other things that help gather good data to give the recommendation algorithm a much better chance. And I would be much more aggressive at building in A-B testing so that I could all test different layouts, different algorithms much more effectively. So those are the things I would do differently. God help me if I'm not smarter now than I used to be. That would be so sad. Okay, so I think we move the discussions to okay. afterwards to offline. So thanks, Ted, for giving this talk. And I'll come over and ask you the question. <laughs>